right. Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday. How are you feeling? Nope. The correct answer was cold. We were looking for, it is cold outside, y'all. Did you notice this? Yes. I don't know. Throw your hand up. Wave at me if you remember the, the times of past when our church was in the gymnasium. You remember this? Yeah. And we would go into that gym on days like today, and, uh, and I would preach in a parka. Uh, with gloves. Remember those days? Remember those days? So, yes, praise God for, for many split air and heating systems that pump hot air into this room. Mm, yes, Lord. I was, uh, I was raised in a warm place, and so uh, the first thought I had when I was taking my, my daughter to school on, I think it was like Tuesday, and it was, it was a degree, one, a whole degree, and I was like, I think this is what hell feels like. I don't think... Like when it's so cold it burns, I'm like, maybe this, I don't know. I just feel like if I die and I wake up and it's one, I was wrong. That's what I mean. <laughs> All right. Um, today we are continuing our teaching series called Abide, uh, which has been the theme of our week of prayer and fasting. It's been the uh, series we've been in uh, in the new year, and it's the series of teaching that we're doing, as you saw, with our whole global family of churches and ministries all across uh, our every nation world. And uh, and, and so to do that today, we're going to be in the book of John. We'll be in chapter 8, and so you can go ahead and turn there. As you're turning there, I uh, just want to take a second and uh, and remind you that uh, Monday is the is the holiday in which we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, and normally, uh, you know, we obviously have a day off and, and you know day off is is great and all. But um, I wanted to take just a second before we dive into the scriptures and in light of that weekend and, and Black History Month coming up and stuff that uh, you all know that over the last eighteen to twenty four months, man, it, the the racial tension in our nation has really been dialed up, right? Well, you're sitting in a multi-ethnic miracle. Churches like this make up less than 4% of the churches that exist in the United States, multi-ethnic churches. You're sitting in one of the largest ones in New England. And that is both a wonderful blessing and an enormous stewardship, an enormous responsibility. And so what I want to do is I want to pray. I want to thank God for Dr. King's legacy. I want to pray for our church uh, and I want to pray one concentric circle out for, for our, our nation, that by means of God bringing reconciliation and peace here, we would be ministers of reconciliation there. Amen? Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Um, none of us deserve to be in church at all. It's all by grace. But Lord, thank you for the additional grace of the fact that today we can, we can sit in a church where there are a lot of people that are just not like us. Lord, thank you for the legacy of Dr. King. Thank you, Lord, for the way he led in faith and, and peaceful protest to bring about, um, to, to point out real sin and to bring about some national repentance and change. Lord, we find ourselves again in a time where... Uh, Racial tension in our nation it seems to be like at a fever pitch, and, um, and it's scary, and it's tense, and it's hard, and it's hurtful, Lord, and it's, it threatens to be divisive, and in the hands of the enemy, it will be. But Lord, I'm asking, I'm asking that in this house, it would not be so. I'm asking that in this house, you would bring a spirit of reconciliation. I'm asking that in this house, you'd bring a spirit of peace and of freedom. Lord, I'm asking that in this house we would be able to see the ways we need to treat each other rightly. I thank you that your justification and your justice doesn't come because we are a certain skin color or ethnic background or we hold a certain passport or make a certain amount of money or happen to be a certain age. Lord, you are unbelievably kind to all of us, but you are not a God who commits the sin of partiality. So God, since we are your people, forgive us where we have committed that sin. Help us in this house to be ministers of reconciliation. God, I pray that no matter what anyone comes in here looking like, feeling like, they would feel safe and at home in the presence of God. Lord, where we can both be loved and accepted and be forgiven for sins we've committed. Lord, I'm asking that because of what you do, not just in this church, but in your church, Lord, you would bring healing to our nation. Lord, there is no political platform that can heal this. 
There is no book we can read. There is no system of thought outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can bring true healing and peace and reconciliation and justice. And so, God, would you bring healing to our nation? Would you dial down the temperature, Lord? Would you be with our leaders who are able to to speak words that can either inflame and enrage or heal? And God, give them a spirit of peace. And Lord, would you bring about a national repentance, just as you did when Dr. King preached faithfully the love and reconciling grace of God? Would you do it again, Lord? We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for praying with me. I appreciate that. Um, So in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, today we're going to read two very, 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 very famous verses. And they're so commonly known and they're so commonly quoted outside of Christian circles that you might not catch them. You might find, oh, yeah, I already know that. So, So really dial in. Here we go. John 8 31 and 32 say this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let me try it again. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, please be with us as we study. Would you empower my words? Would you open the ears and minds and hearts of those who are hearing me today? And God, would you, because of your truth, set us free? In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, I hope you guys got to come out to our uh, some of our prayer meetings during this week of prayer and fasting. Uh, uh, if, if you did, can we just give a round of applause for amazing volunteers, worship leaders? Like, yeah, it, you guys, great job. It, it was awesome. Like, everybody who led those, it, it was, they were really powerful. Um, I, I got to help lead the final evening, and, and in that evening, I kind of shared my, uh, my tense relationship with uh, the verb abide. I'm an action verbs kind of person. Amen? Amen. I like, let's do things, let's accomplish, let's, 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 but, but when it comes to a word like abide, it's like a, it's an action verb that, yeah, right? Like you're not going to write in your calendar, like on Thursday at three o'clock, what are you doing? Abide. Like you're not going to do that, right? That's not a thing. There's no team of people that are going to go out abiding on Friday night. Like that's not a thing <laughs> that's going to happen. It's, it's right up there with the action verb, like be like, okay. Like if I guess I'm, that's what you're always doing. And so when Jesus says things like we just read, like, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. On one hand, I find it helpful immediately. But on the other hand, I don't because I don't have a, that that word doesn't immediately grab me. You know what I mean? So if we're going to understand what he's saying here, we've got to kind of get our heads and our hearts and our minds around this word abide because what the word means is simply to like live in, to dwell with, to be with, to stay in. You abide in the place that you live. You know what I mean? And so as I was thinking about this word, I I got to thinking a little bit about um, the the last few months of my life. The last few months of my life, um, I've I've been traveling back and forth, as I've mentioned to you uh, before, traveling back and forth to, to and from my hometown. And in the fall of 2022, weirdly and unexpectedly, I managed to spend more time in my home than I have since I moved out at 17. Including all of the vacation time I've gone back to visit combined. So in 21 years, suddenly finding myself in my mom's house. And what I, what, what's weird about it is how much it felt like home. How much the, the chili she makes smelled like it should. And the couch was like, welcome back, right? And just kind of the, the way that my mom's house works, the, 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 um, the particular smell of the laundry detergent that she uses, there's just some things that feel like home. I haven't lived in Florida in a long, long, long time, but as soon as I walk out and you get that mix of like, uh, you know, uh, beach in your nose and like it's moist air, nothing like this horrible demonic dry air that we have here. Um, <laughs> And it just like felt like, oh yeah, I, rem- I like 
I remember how to do all this. But what's weird is that there was never a time in my childhood where I was like, I will now commit my mother's laundry detergent to memory. <sighs> right? You never did that. Um, it, it just, because I lived there, it just got in my bones. And it was so inside me that even though I hadn't really lived there in like 21 years, it was still there. That's what I think abiding means. Abiding, the kind of thing that Jesus is inviting us to do, it is simple. Jesus is saying, abide in my word. That's it. That, that's the big command. There it is. Abide in the word. But like, that needs some explanation, right? Because on the one hand, you're like, okay, got it. Great, let's pray. But on the other hand, just because it's a simple set of words doesn't mean it's an easy thing to do. So the, the abiding that he's commanding us to do and the abiding that he's inviting us to do is not simply visiting the word, is not simply having an encounter with the word, not simply reading it from time to time, not simply downloading the Bible app, not simply doing the things that like get you visiting the word. It's, it's when I get up and I pack all my things and I move in to Jesus' words, to Jesus' mindset, to the emotions that God feels about the world, to the thoughts that God thinks about the world, to the kinds of things Jesus says his disciples should do in the world. I got to get my life up, pick it up, and move it over here and settle down outside of the world's words, outside of Adam Mabry's words, outside of Republican words and Democratic words and old words and young words and North and South words and rich and poor words, all those words. And I got to move in to Jesus' words so that it feels so much like home that the smell and the taste and the emotions are home base for me. And I begin to speak with the accent of heaven. And I begin to see through the lens of heaven. And I begin to feel the way about the world that God feels. And I'm not trying to do it. It's just so inside me that it's just happening. Does that make sense? That's what abiding means. <laughs> and that makes it a little harder. Now, okay, so what does word mean? We should, we should define that word too. Word means both like the word, as in your, uh, your, your Bible right here, like your Bible, and it, it means something still more. Jesus is saying that as we live in Scripture, we're somehow living in his thoughts. The, the, word, the Greek word for word is a very um, special word. It's a lot of use of the word word. It doesn't just mean like the text on a page. It means the thoughts and intentions of the author. It means the, the, the mindset of the one who speaks and the one who writes. He's saying, I want you to live, abide, dwell in, move into my word. We're to abide in this word. In such a way that this word is like swallowing me whole. In such a way that this word becomes the view through which I see the world. In such a way that this word is my hometown, is my mom's house, is her laundry detergent, is the smell of the chili and the warmth of the couch. You feeling me? So the, we'll be in the Gospel of John around the word abide both next week and the week after that because John hangs a lot of things on this word abide. And, and we'll talk about that more. But here, he, Jesus is making it very simple. And I just want to walk you through this very simple like syllogism about what happens and why it's so important that we abide in the word. And I had to take a second to explain what I mean by abide because I don't want you thinking like, I've read my Bible before and then thinking that's what he means. It's not. The people that he was speaking to had read more of the Bible than you and I have probably ever read and committed more of it to memory, I would imagine. He's not talking about simply that. He's talking about living in it. So what's at stake? We abide in the word of God first because we're disciples. Listen, there are no like levels to Christianity, okay? This is not like a martial art. This is not like school. This is not like some sort of Masonic lodge, temple kind of bop, 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 bop. That last one was weird. You'll find out about it later. It, there are Christians and there aren't. 
but there's no like multi-level marketing scheme within the kingdom of God. Are you feeling me? So when I say disciple, I don't mean like the extra super holy Christians who've been around for a while. I mean the Christians. When Jesus said, go make disciples at the end of Matthew, he didn't mean go make Christians better Christians. He meant go invite people to apprentice their lives to King Jesus, to turn away from sin and move into the kingdom of God, to pick up their lives, repent, walk away, move here and trust in Jesus. Are you following me? So if you want to be a Christian, you're signing up to be a disciple, which is why around here we like to say that we exist. The whole purpose of our church is to make disciples. You bring the truth and the grace and the changing power of the gospel of Jesus, the glory of God, and the good of all people. We take that super seriously. And so Jesus has just said, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciple. Now, using the transitive property of logic, we can flip that around and go, if you don't, you're not. Now, at this point, you might be having one of a couple of reactions. One might be, wow, Adam, that was loud. And the other might be, oh, no. I might be Christ adjacent. I might live in his neighborhood, but I might not be abiding with him. I might really like Jesus. I might really respect Jesus. These guys did. I don't know if you caught the beginning, but it says, he said to the Jews who believed in him. That's a very interesting way to describe the people he was talking to because they weren't Pharisees, which are the bad guys, but nor were they disciples, which were disciples. These guys were kind of in the fickle middle. Like, I like Jesus, kind of into what you're saying, but eh, I'm not real sure that, like, I'm fully on board with everything. I'm sure that the Jews who believed in him thought themselves especially uh, intelligent and sophisticated because they were like, well, I like what Jesus is saying and part of these things, but, you know, I'm not sure that I'm really with his political program. You know anyone else who feigns uh, complexity of thought through Choicative disobedience. These guys were kind of in the tug of war. Do I really want to follow Jesus or not? And maybe you're there. And maybe the best thing I can do for you today is to help you know you're actually there. You're not here. It's really hard to figure out where you should go if you don't know where you are. And maybe you're, you're in that fickle middle where you're saying, look, I, I like Jesus. I'm a fan of Jesus. I sing to Jesus. I'm really into the good things that church kind of gives to my life socially. Amen. But like, I'm not sure that I'm totally on board with apprenticing my whole life, mind, will, body, emotions, money, sexuality, pol- uh, politics, job, future, family, everything to King Jesus. I'm not sure that I'm in for that, but I like him. Jesus is saying, If you abide in my word, you're my disciples. And conversely, if we don't, we're not. So what what does it mean? Well, I already told you what it means to abide in his word. It it means that, not that you're fully there yet, because you won't fully arrive. No one is like, you know, hitting the age of like 62 and suddenly I'm fully abiding. (laughs) But but the desire of your heart is, I, I want the words and the thoughts and the emotions and the actions and the truths that Jesus says to be my native tongue. We abide in his word because we're his disciples. Which means those of you who are his disciples, I, I want to encourage you, man, keep abiding in the word. You know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say if you feel the holy tingle every time you abide in my word, you're my disciples. Some of you, you read your Bible and you're like, I mean, all right. Jeremiah, I don't know what you're on about, and you seem upset and then very happy at other times, and I, all right, keep abiding in the word. Okay, Lamentations, you are bummed out, at least you're only five chapters. Okay, Revelation, I don't even know what that means. Listen, when you were growing up, you lived in your family without fully understanding all of its dynamics. You grew into it, right? But like when your dad was doing the taxes at three, you weren't like, don't forget line 10C. Like you weren't, 
you didn't understand it all, but it was there. Move into the word, is what he's saying. If we're disciples, that's what we do. We abide because we're his disciples, which takes it to the second thing. If you abide in my word, then you are fully my disciples, and you will know the truth. So we abide in the word that we may know what is true. There are a lot of so-called sources of knowledge that you and I just believe by default without ever mapping it onto the word of God. At the risk of being somewhat controversial, there's a lot of what passes for truth with regard to race relations and reconciliation that has no home in the word of God. A, a lot. There's a lot of what passes for good economics that are going to lift others out of poverty that has no home in the word of God that will actually condemn others to poverty. There's a lot of so-called truth that's going, supposed to make the world a better place, make your family better, make your mind better, make your body better, make sexuality better, make all these kinds of things better because it's true that if you map it against the word of God, it is literally the opposite of what God's word says. And, and you and I happen to be in one of the most proud and arrogant places on the planet where people with PhDs in infinitesimally small areas make, I know, I'm getting one, I know, right? It's okay, it's a safe place. Like, I know, it's all right. Making, getting a PhD does not make you a magician, you're not Gandalf, okay? You don't suddenly know, like, I have returned for the turning of the tide. You'd not... You'd not, that's not what it does. It doesn't confer wisdom upon you. It just means that you can do the same thing for seven years and indenture yourself to a university whilst doing it. <laughs> and yet, when we get some degree conferred upon us by some institution, we imagine ourselves to now be the font of knowledge and we're treated by the rest of our society as a cast of priests who if we don't fo follow everything that they say, then we're somehow questioning something that should not ever be questioned. It sounds an awful lot more like a really dumb religion than a really good way to live. And then, and then if you get to happen to maybe get tenure at some of the world's most hollowed halls of learning and you say things that you think are true based on your bad research, it ends up hurting disproportionately people you'll never meet because bad ideas that start there end up impoverishing people at the very margins of society. And you say, Pastor Adam, you seem passionate about that. I am. I hate it. I hate it. I think God does too. Just imagine that you might be one of those one day. High likelihood, some of you will be. You'll be the mucky muck endowed chair of thus and so. And you'll have gotten your PhD in some vanishingly small field of interest that three people read. But now it's you. You're it. You're the head of the department. How will you know truth? Because Jesus says, if you abide in my word, and I'm not talking proof texting. I'm talking living in the shape and the contour of the text. Then you're a disciple. Then you know truth. Then you know truth. There is a lot that passes for truth that's not true. It's not. But abiding in the word, another way of saying this is that like you are building a biblical world and life view. I hesitate to call it that because that can sound purely academic. I... It means you're building a biblical world and life view and aesthetic taste and set of activities. It's a whole thing. It's a mind, it's a heart, it's a, it's a hands thing. That's what it means to abide in the word. Are, are you following me? It's not just that you give mental assent to like correct theological presuppositions or whatever. It means that when I see something that God calls sin, I have compassion on the sinner and I, I'm dis. I find it distasteful. I don't like it. Not because I'm a judgmental person or I'm some kind of fill-in-the-blank phobe. Just because, because I love people because they bear the image of God and I hate what is false because it's not something that God believes and if God doesn't believe it, then it's not true. And if it's not true, then it ends up doing the third thing, which is keeping people in bondage. If you believe something about the world that is not true, then it won't work. 
It won't work. You're like, well, I have a study that stuff your study. It won't work. And it will hurt people and cause more disintegration rather than reintegration. It will call, cause more disunity rather than community. It will cause more pain rather than reconciliation. If we are his disciples, then we abide in the word and we know what is true. My friends, part of the way, the reason that we, we, we move into the word of God is because that's the only way you're going to know how to apply it to whatever it is that you do. You're like, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about internet technology development. No, I know that. But it says everything about everything that impacts the way you think about everything. So can you imagine, perhaps, like if, uh, I don't know, Mark Zuckerberg had saturated himself in the scriptures, if there had been some faithful disciples walking around Harvard's campus at the time. How different the whole world that we're living in might be. I'm serious. And I'm not picking on him at all. I don't mean to shame him or anything like that. It's, just, it's an interesting thought experiment, isn't it? If, if you brought a biblical world and life and aesthetic view into your lab, what might be, I don't know what would be different. If you brought it into your place of business, if you brought it into your bank, if you brought it into your home, if you brought it into that conversation that you're having with your kids, if you brought it into the conversation that some of you need to have after this when you break up with that person, I'm going to let you sit on that for a second. That's good and uncomfortable. Whew, move on, Pastor. Okay. How awkward would it be if you're sitting next to them? That'd be weird. Yeah. Don't tell me about that later. Uh, we'll know truth. It takes us to the third thing. We abide in the word of God because we're his disciples so that we can know truth so that we can be free. When you believe what is false, you're, you become enslaved to the false thing. Th this text comes in a very interesting uh, context. And so Jesus is talking to the Jews that believe in him, and right, they're kind of in the fickle middle. And he says this, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And they're like, hey, a minute. We haven't been enslaved to anybody. Remember, like Exodus? And Jesus is like, yeah, I'm a rabbi, I remember. That's my interpretation of the Greek gets in there, I'm sure. Um, and he says, well, yeah, but see, if any of you commit sin, you are a slave to sin. Now you're hoping that something I say will soften that, and I can't. If any of you make a habit of sinning, he says, then you're enslaved to sin. And they're like, we are not slaves to anybody. We're the sons of Abraham. And Jesus said, yeah, I, I know that, but if you were really his sons then you would live like him, and Abraham was filled with faith. But because you commit lies, and you believe lies, and you speak lies, you know who your real dad is? Satan. He says this. How to win friends and influence people by Jesus of Nazareth. Like, I know some of you think that I can be a little edgy, but gee whiz. He just says that. He's not trying to be hateful at all. But he's trying to be truthful and say, listen, if you say you want to follow me, but you disagree with the things that I say, and then live in a way I don't want you to, you will become in bondage, not to me, but to sin. You won't serve me, you'll serve sin. You'll be enslaved to sin. And you'll serve that. Like, there's no version of following Jesus. And like, I... One of the biggest favors that I can do for you today is, is perhaps like shake you enough with this truth. I, I mean, I'm not trying to offend you. I love you. But if some of you walk out of this moment today going, I don't know that I actually follow Jesus, that would be a win. Because these people thought that they were following him. They were literally following him. Like around He's like, but you're not disciples because you're not, you don't abide in my word and you therefore don't know truth. And therefore, because you don't know truth, you don't do truth. 
and you're, you're enslaved to these acts that you think are the right way to live, and they're not. Some of you are enslaved to a set of behaviors because you have been told that it is who you are. No, it's not. Some of you are enslaved to a diagnosis because you've been told it's who you are, as if your, your doctor can come down with a tablet from Mount Sinai and say, this is what you are. Diagnoses are just that. They're not destinies. They're just that, diagnoses. It's certainly not an excuse for sin. Now, I know some of you are like, but you don't know mine. Don't do that with me. I don't need to. Some of you are enslaved to the things your parents spoke over you or didn't speak over you. Some of you are enslaved to the things that a political leader says or your favorite podcaster has mentioned. And what I'm telling you is just what Jesus said, but if you know truth, it'll set you free. It'll set you free. You can be free of that addiction. You can. You can be free of that habit or hang up. And say, I don't really have a problem. You know, it's, it's, it's a good thing. I... If it's in your head right now while I'm talking about it, that's the Holy Spirit. We are to abide in the word. And the math is simple. If you abide in my word, then you're a disciple and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It is a premise with a three-part conclusion. So we abide in the word because we're his disciples. We abide in the word because we want to know what's true. And we abide in the word so that we can be free. And I'm here to tell you, you can be, man. I'm here to tell you, you absolutely can be. There are there's power in this word. There's power in these stories. There's power in the, the, the pointed sword of the text to divide what is true from what is false, to open your eyes to areas of agreement and disagreement with the world so that you can move into this thing, that it might be home for you. And here's the thing that Jesus is doing. Now, I told you that, you know, and I, we took a lot of time to de define what the word abide means, but it didn't take too long to define the, the word word. It means the Bible, but Elsewhere in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the word, and I am truth. So what's he really saying? If you abide in the word, man, you're living with me. You want to feel close to God? That's a lame goal. Be close to God. Feelings will follow. Your feelings don't always tell you it's true. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they just tell you how you feel. You want to be close to God? Move into the Word. Commit this year. I want to know what the Bible says about the human body. I want to know what the Bible says about what it means to be me where I am. I want to know what it would feel like to live in this set of stories increasingly so that it becomes the smell in my nose and the sound in my ears and the song of my heart so the things that God loves becomes the thing I love. So the things that God does becomes the things that I enjoy doing. And the beliefs that God has about the world become the beliefs that I have about the world so that I will be free from sin. I will know what is truth. Therefore, be his disciples and abide with him. See how that works? It's so simple and yet not easy. Man, if we abide in his word, family, oh, we get him. We get him. We get God. We want to make this really intensely practical for you. So like if you have the Aletheia app right on the front page, if you're like, I don't know where to start reading my Bible. Some of you, you began your Bible reading plan. You're like, this is the year. I'm going to read the Bible in a year. And it's going great right now because you're like in the Genesis 30s. And it's like, this is a pretty good story. Do, 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 do. And then like, they'll get to Exodus. Now you're feeling good. You're like one book down, 65 to go. Exodus 1, 2, 3, 16, 17. Then you hit 20 and you're like, oh. And it's nothing but instructions on how to build a tent. And you're like, I don't care. I don't need this. What do I do? Keep going. I want to help you read this word. We want to help you read this word. If you open the, the, your app, there's a, there's a uh, we have a, a bing. It looks like that. Um, 
like our friends at the Bible Project designed a like a 20 day how to read the Bible Bible reading plan. It has videos. You can do this. You can. You totally can. Like we've got groups of people we want you to read the Word of God with. We've got classes to help you grow in reading the Word of God. We've got Discover Discipleship that is designed to help you discover discipleship. <laughs> we, I teach an Establishing Foundations class in this church. It's like a 12-week deep marination in the Word of God. Come. Come. Do it. Like, get, let's get in this thing. I don't know what next step you need to take, but come on, let's go. Let's abide with him. Let's move out of what was our hometown, out of thinking that, you know, our favorite progressive politics or conservative politics or our favorite economics or our favorite kind of worldview or patched together spiritual gobbledygook is right. It's not. We lay it down. We move our stuff over here into the word of God, into the world of God, into the thoughts of God so that we can more become the people of God. Let's do it. This can happen. It can happen for you. And it starts if you just do just what I said for the very first time. That, that's uh, it's just, just me acting out repentance and faith. The word repent literally means to turn around. And believe means to trust. Some of you are, maybe are realizing for the very first time, yo, I've gone to church my whole life. I've been to Bible study. I have not moved out and moved in. I have not immigrated. I have not found a new hometown in Jesus. And my invitation to you today is abide in the word. Father, help us. Help us move into the word. Some of us need to do it for the first time. Some of us need to saturate ourselves. Some of us need to, to build a biblical worldview. Some, look, we, got, we all got next steps so we can be more like you, God. Help us to abide in your precious word. Thank you for your precious word.